In this series of lectures, I'll be showing you disk and file system management. We'll look at how we actually create partitions on a disk, a brand new drive, and then we'll look at the various file systems we can put on that drive. After that, we'll look at how do we mount it? How do we make it accessible to the system and to the users on there? And then we'll also take a look at maintaining it. What happens if the file system becomes corrupt or maybe we have to modify certain parameters? What can we do with that? And then finally, we'll look at advanced disk management and I'll take a deep look at both RAID and LVM technology, two things that are very, very common in industry. Let's get started. The first thing we need to look at is partition types and there are various ways we can actually partition a drive, some of them quite advanced. Next, after that, we'll discuss the naming conventions for drives and the partitions on those drives. They can seem a little intimidating at first, but actually it's pretty intuitive. And then finally, we'll look at the tools that we actually use to partition. FDisk and PartEd, the two primary command line tools that we use to partition new disks. But there's also a graphical tool called GParted that does an excellent job. So let's go ahead and take a look at those. Before we start talking about partitioning types, I do want to look at the device labels that are given by Linux to drives that are installed in the system. These three circles represent three physical drives. And if I was to say to you that we were going to call this first drive over here, drive one, and this one drive two, and this one drive three, that would make sense, that's logical. But how about instead of saying drive one, drive two, and three, I actually just give it letters in the alphabet and I say that this is A, and this is B, and this is C. Once again, still logical because you know, third letter in the alphabet is the third drive. So that makes sense. Well, that's exactly what Linux does when it gives names to drives. Now, there is a little thing you need to know. Typically, in a modern system, what we'll have is a, either a serial ATA drive, or maybe an SSD, solid state drive, or maybe a SCSI drive of some kind. In the Linux world, a, any of those drives, anything starting with an S, the drive would start with an S. So the first drive in Linux would be something like this. S for SCSI or serial ATA, D for drive, the letter A. That's the first drive, the first physical drive. Same thing with B. It would be S, D, B, and S, D, C. Perfectly logical. Now, the only exception to this is if we're dealing with an IDE drive, older drives that utilize the IDE interface. If it's IDE, it's going to start with an H. So H is IDE. Anything with an S is going to be serial ATA or SSD or SCSI. So once again, not difficult to understand. H, think of hard drive. S, we think of serial ATA or SSD. And then the D just represents that it's a drive. And then the letter in the alphabet represents what drive it is in the system. A, B, C, or D, one, two, or three. Now, if we were to take this and let's say drive, drive A, we install it and then we partition it. So there's three steps really we have to go through. We have to install the drive. It's a blank slate, nothing on it. Then we have to partition it, create a barrier where we can now format it and put a file system that we can save items on. So let's say we'll look at this one right here, drive one. And what we'll say is it has one partition, one partition on it. Well, in Linux, that SDA to represent that there's one partition, the first partition on that one would be SDA1. There's only one partition on this entire drive. So this entire drive is used for one partition. The second drive will say that there's actually two partitions on here. I've broken it into two partitions. I have partition one, partition two. Well, what will happen with that is that you'll end up in the file system, a device labeled SDB1 and S D, B, two. And the same thing would happen if I had three partitions here. So if I have three partitions on the third drive, you would end up with SDC1, SDC2, and SDC3. Now, all of these 
these these SD SD files reside in the dev directory. So it's not uncommon for me to describe a file. Let's say we're talking about the first one over here. I would describe it as slash dev slash SD a one if it has a partition on it so it has one partition that's the way I would describe it and then here there would be a file for a slash dev slash sdb1 slash dev slash sdb2 and so on so it's really not difficult to figure out the drives and this is important because we're going to look at actually partitioning the drives next but first why would we want to create multiple partitions there's a lot of reasons we want to do that especially on a file server but in a Linux system typically things will be partitioned off and this is a little strange for people coming from a windows world because on a windows world if you if you're used to a windows desktop what you end up with is one big drive and that drive is typically called the c drive right so that's what it is it looks like that and it has one partition that's it now you can create more partitions if you want to and in the old days when drives were more expensive and i didn't have the money i would many times partition my drives into multiple partitions primarily so that i would put the operating system on one end let me get rid of this so my drive would look something like this so i'd have my drive as soon as i get it i would partition it off into two partitions i would create two partitions and those partitions in a windows world would be c and d because right, that's how Windows starts out. A and B is left for floppy drives and things like that in the past. And what I would do is I would install Windows on this partition, the C partition. The operating system would go here, but the, my documents in that type of folder, I would put on the D drive. Now, why would I do that? I would do that because there's a very likely chance that the Windows partition, the Windows operating system itself, will have to be reinstalled. So once I had everything installed the way I wanted, I would image out the Windows partition, right? I would put it in, save it onto a, save it onto a DVD or something like that, a little image it out there. And I would also have a backup of the D partition going out to another hard drive out here someplace. And if I needed to, let's say Windows became corrupted and it was destroyed. I could go back, get that image, dump that image back onto the C partition and literally be back up and going within 15 minutes. And here's the key. If the worst case scenario did not happen, I would not have to restore my docs because they were safe on the D partition. They were never touched, hopefully. And that happened to me quite a few times, actually. So there's many, many good reasons. In a server environment, you want to put user home directories on a separate separate drive or separate partition typically in a server environment you're gonna have many drives involved here but if we're talking one drive you're definitely going to put that on a separate partition var logs another reason you put them on a separate partition because those things can grow dynamically and just like if i only had one partition and i lost that whole partition well then i would lose my documents too if there was only one partition so putting things on separate partitions is very logical it makes a lot of sense and what we're going to do next is actually go and take a look at partitionings and the different types of partitions we can create.